Welcome to the Zen Crypto Show, where we explain cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology in simple terms, so you can feel comfortable interacting with crypto and investing in these exciting new digital assets. I'm your host, Sebastian Couture. One of the things I get asked a lot is why there are so many fees in crypto. I mean, there are fees every time you buy or sell and anytime you send crypto to another person. Why do we pay these fees and where do they go? Well, today I'm going to break down all the fees so you know what you're paying for and how you might be able to pay less fees. In part one, I'll talk about network fees, which are paid to miners and validators of a blockchain, and these are central to the way that decentralized systems work. In part two, I'll explain the different platform and trading fees that centralized exchanges charge their customers. And finally, I'll share some suggestions on how you can reduce and optimize the amount of fees you pay on your crypto journey. So let's get started. One of the things that crypto and the traditional financial world have in common is that you need to pay fees to send and receive funds and when you exchange cryptocurrencies for one another or for fiat currency. But in crypto, we introduce a new type of fee that can be difficult to wrap your head around if you're a first-time user. These are called network fees. In episodes one and two, when we talked about Bitcoin and Ethereum, we discussed miners, and we talked about the fact that they get rewarded for securing the blockchain. In addition to this reward, they also receive fees from users who are sending money on the blockchain. So when you send a transaction on the blockchain, whether it's Bitcoin or Ethereum or any other cryptocurrency, you always pay a fee to the miner who ends up including that transaction in the block. It's kind of like a tip, and it can be adjusted higher or lower depending on how urgent it is for you to get that transaction processed. I'll explain more on this in a little bit. So if we're talking about blocks, we also learned how transactions get packaged into blocks and how these blocks are validated by miners. Well, in Bitcoin, for example, a new block is mined and validated every 10 minutes. In Dogecoin, it's every minute. And on Ethereum, it's every couple of seconds. But the important thing to understand here is that blocks are limited in their size. And as a consequence, there can only be a limited amount of transactions in every block. Now, you might be asking why this limit even exists, and that's a really good question. The answer isn't simple, and it depends on the blockchain. But the shorter answer is that it has to do with the fact that blockchains are decentralized, as opposed to stored on a database of a centralized company like a bank or PayPal. And because transactions need to be synchronized in real time across thousands of computers around the world, well, there are limits to how many transactions can be included in every block. The good thing is there's lots of really smart people working on this problem and finding innovative ways to pack more transactions into every block so that we can get more throughput on these blockchains. So if we stick to the premise that there is a limited amount of space in every block, and as a consequence, a limited amount of transactions which can get added at every block, well, we come to the conclusion that people must compete for that space if they're paying fees. So transaction fees are a function of supply and demand. And that just means that if there are more people who want to make transactions at any given time, the transaction fees are naturally going to go up because people are essentially competing for who can get their transactions in a block. So let's take a simple example. Imagine a blockchain where there was only enough space for 10 transactions per block. But 15 people are trying to get their transactions through right now. Well, I think you can see how we're going to run into a problem here because there simply isn't enough space. Five of those people are willing to pay 50 cents. Five others are willing to pay 25 cents. And the remaining five are only paying 10 cents. And since miners get to choose which transactions get added in every block, well, they're logically going to choose the 10 people who are offering 50 and 25 cents. I mean, wouldn't you? The remaining five people who are only paying 10 cents, well, they're going to have to wait until the next block. Or if the demand stays high, they're going to have to wait until the time at which the fees come down enough. That is to say the demand comes down enough for miners to add their transaction in a block. 
Now, I want to reassure you, the miners are not looking at these transactions on a screen and clicking on the ones they want to add in the block. There are thousands of transactions going through at any time, and they wouldn't be able to do this work manually. So their computers basically are doing this work for them and picking the transactions that will go through based on parameters that they've set. Blockchains create a fee market where users bid on the limited amount of space in a block. And what's cool is that the fee will generally remain the same whether you're sending $100 or a billion dollars. This is very different to the fee structure in the traditional financial world where you usually pay a percentage of the money you're sending, especially if you're sending money overseas. You know, in April of 2020, one of the largest Bitcoin transactions in history was for over a billion dollars in Bitcoin. And the person who sent that transaction paid less than $5 in fees. In smart contract blockchains like Ethereum, the fee calculation can get a little bit more complicated. And the amount of the fee will depend on the complexity of the operation. So for simple transactions where Ether is sent from one address to another, the fees will be considerably low. But transactions that involve interacting with a decentralized application will have a higher fee, typically three to five times as high as simple transfers. So examples of some of these more complex operations could be sending stable coins like USDC or lending and borrowing money on Aave. And we'll talk more about decentralized applications in a future episode. On your crypto journey, you may hear of Ethereum fees referred to as gas fees. Remember in episode two, we talked about how Ether is the gas which powers the world computer? Well, that's where this term comes from. So just to give you an idea of how much network fees will generally cost, as I'm writing this, the average Bitcoin transaction fee is about $5. But there have been times where there was a really high demand and the fee shot up to $30 or $60. And for Ethereum... The fees right now are about the same, but there are certainly times when there's lots of demand for transactions and where these will shoot up to you know, close to $100 for even just a simple transaction. Now, you may have heard of other newer generation blockchains like Cosmos, Solana, Binance Smart Chain, and Polkadot, and these have much higher transaction throughput and the fees rarely go above a few cents. As for Ethereum, it's on track to update to a new version in the next few months. This is called Ethereum 2.0, and this will greatly improve the transaction throughput on Ethereum. And then there are platforms built on top of Bitcoin and Ethereum that are coming online, which increase the effective number of transactions those networks can support. These are called Layer 2 solutions, and it's kind of like putting a trailer on the back of your truck. The Bitcoin Lightning Network, for example, allows a much higher number of near instantaneous transactions at a fraction of a cent per transaction. And on Ethereum, there are a number of layer two solutions that promise to increase the transaction speed and throughput. So I'm sure this all sounds really complicated and intimidating, but here's what matters to you. It's all quite transparent when you're sending transactions in a wallet. Before you confirm any transaction, wallets will always show you the estimated transaction fee. And most wallets will actually give you an option to choose the fee you're willing to pay. So if you're in a hurry, you can select a higher fee and have a higher chance of being added in the next block. But if you can wait, you're free to pay a lower fee and get added to a later block. Now let's talk about platform and trading fees. These are the transaction fees you'll encounter when dealing with any crypto exchange or trading platform. These are the fees that companies charge for the services they provide. And we talked about in episode eight when we discussed buying Bitcoin that exchanges are closed systems operated by centralized companies. And there are a number of fees that these companies charge their customers for all types of operations. So exchanges sometimes hide these fees, giving you the wrong impression that they're offering a better rate than they really are. And sometimes they charge much higher than the fair fee just because they can. So if your money is on an exchange, they're ultimately in control of it and not you. This is important to remember. 
Now, I'm not trying to steer you away from using exchanges. I use exchanges to buy and sell crypto and millions of other people do as well. But before buying and selling crypto on an exchange, it's important that you do research about the company's fee structure because you don't want to get stuck there. And this is what sometimes happens to people. Now, let me tell you about the different fees you should look out for when dealing with an exchange. So right off the bat, if you buy crypto with a credit card, there are usually processing fees which get added to the transaction. And you'll see a summary of these fees before you confirm your transaction. Next, we've got on-ramp and off-ramp fees. And this is the cost of sending money between a bank and a crypto exchange. And they're called on and off-ramp because the exchange serves as a way to get fiat money on or off of the crypto ecosystem. Anytime you operate in the space which exists between your bank and a crypto exchange, there are going to be fees. So once you've sent money to an exchange, they're going to charge you fees for buying and selling crypto with fiat. So for example, if you sent money to an exchange and now you have some US dollars sitting there and now you want to buy Bitcoin, well, they're going to charge you a fee. And it's typically a percentage of the amount that you're converting. And depending on the exchange, the fee can be less than a percent to several percentage points. So if you're transacting in large amounts, these fees can climb really quick. You might also be charged the fee when exchanging crypto to crypto. And that means buying and selling one cryptocurrency for another cryptocurrency. So like Bitcoin for Ether, for example. And in most cases, crypto to crypto fees are less than what you would pay for crypto to fiat transactions. And finally, exchanges may charge you a really high fee when withdrawing your own crypto from the platform to a wallet. And this is where lots of people get burned because they don't have much of an alternative if they want to get that crypto out of the exchange. So be sure to watch out for that. Some exchanges even offer like free transactions for a month and then will charge you an exorbitantly high fee if you're trying to get your crypto out of there. So be sure to do your research here. Now that you're familiar with the different types of fees when using crypto, here are my top five tips to help reduce the amount of fees you pay. Number one, beware of exchange fees. Before using an exchange like Coinbase, Bitstamp, Kraken, Binance, or Crypto.com, be aware of their fee structure. And you can usually find this information in the customer support or help section of their website. I can't emphasize this enough. Exchanges sound great until you want to withdraw money. Then you run into these really high withdrawal fees you're stuck paying if you want to move your crypto anywhere else. Before you move large amounts of money onto an exchange, just try it out first. So you can try buying and trading and exchanging crypto and even withdrawing a small amount from the exchange. And you do this before you jump in with a large sum of money. That way, at least you know what to expect and where they might be trying to hide extra fees. And also keep in mind that exchanges may have a tiered fee system. So withdrawing $500 might not be very expensive, but if you're getting into the 5,000 or five figure range, you may be put into a much more expensive tier and the exchange may even limit how much you can withdraw on a daily or monthly basis. Number two, use exchanges with low trading fees or trading fee discounts. A trading fee discount is kind of like a loyalty point that you get every time you make a trade. And then you can use those points to pay for transaction fees later. But be careful that the costs don't outweigh the benefits when it comes to withdrawal fees. So they might get you in and tell you, hey, we're giving you all these trading fee discounts, but then charge you a lot of money when you're withdrawing that crypto to a wallet. Number three, whenever it's possible, favor doing crypto to crypto trades instead of crypto to fiat trades. And this is because the fees are usually cheaper when trading one crypto for another. So for example, let's say you have Bitcoin and you're ready to sell for US dollars. What you could do is trade it for a stable coin. And a stable coin is a cryptocurrency that has a price that is pegged to the US dollar. 
So the price of the stablecoin will always be $1. And we'll talk more about stablecoins in the future, but you may have heard of ones like USDC, which is connected to Coinbase, or GUSD, which is backed by the Gemini Exchange. And this is a really useful tool to hedge against the volatility of crypto without getting back out into the fiat system. Number four, when moving funds, try to execute transactions when demand is low and therefore transaction fees will be lower. And there are websites that will help you estimate transaction fees for Bitcoin and Ethereum. But as a general rule, transaction fees are typically lower on Saturdays and Sundays. And number five, determine the urgency of your transaction. Some crypto wallets like Zengo will allow you to decide how urgent your transaction is. And if you want it done now, then you can pay a higher fee. But if you don't mind waiting, you can tell the system that you're not in a rush and to execute your transaction when fees are lower. And it's actually pretty cool to see this in action. I hope this gives you a better understanding of the different types of fees you'll encounter on your crypto journey. It's a good idea to always choose the option with lower fees. When considering the cost of fees, I always look at it like this. How much will these fees cost me in the future? In other words, what will the crypto that I'm losing by paying this fee be worth in the future if the price of this crypto appreciates to where I think it might? And if you look at it from that perspective, you'll realize that that $5 fee you're paying today could be worth a few hundred dollars in the future. And if you're making lots of transactions, that money adds up quick, and that's less money in your pocket. Unfortunately, fees are just a central part of the crypto ecosystem. But unlike traditional banking, I find crypto fees to be much more transparent as long as you know where to look. And the decisions you make can really have an impact on the amount of fees you pay. Taking a few minutes to learn about these fees can save you hundreds, if not thousands of dollars down the line. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Zen Crypto Show, which is produced by Zengo, the crypto wallet for everyone, where you can buy, trade, and earn cryptocurrencies with unbelievable simplicity, bulletproof security, and legendary customer support. If you enjoyed this episode, head over to Apple Podcasts and let us know what you learned by leaving a review. And if you'd like to suggest topics for future episodes, email podcast at zengo.com. Until next time, stay zen. The information provided by the Zen Crypto Show is intended for educational and entertainment purposes only and does not constitute financial or investment advice.